In this video, we're going to start covering alternative investments. So uh, we're tackling topics that are included in the very initial learning module of the alternative investment section of the level one curriculum. Um, this recording is called alternative investments, features and uh, methods. So we're going to discuss some basic characteristics um, of alternative investments and the features. We'll also go over very briefly um, the main categories of alternative investments, which are later discussed in your curriculum in more detail. And uh, very importantly, the methods via which investors engage capital in um, in these types of uh, alternative investments. Okay, so uh, let's start by defining what alternative investments are. And actually, the way um, your curriculum does this is by saying what they are not. So alternative investments are investments other than, and uh, what they do is they list public equity, meaning the buying of shares on the public markets, uh, but also uh, public debt, so public uh, fixed income instruments, and uh, also cash instruments, which could be anything from um, you know, put you, keeping your money um, at the bank on some kind of term deposit, or um, you know, as as companies uh, sometimes do on some kind of more tradable in, in some kind of more tradable securities, as institutional investors do, like treasury bills or uh, commercial paper. Although that is still a subset, I would say, of fixed income. Right. Nevertheless, not necessarily public. Okay. So um, it's not the traditional investments into uh, stock exchange listed shares publicly traded bonds or cash products. Um, in a second, we'll, we'll list the categories, but um, the defining features of um, alternative investments as your curriculum lists them, them, and this is going to repeat quite often during this lesson and subsequent lessons as well, is that such investments require definitely more knowledge and more skills than the ones listed over here. So they require specialized knowledge. Uh, sorry, knowledge. Um, what they also um, typically do um, is, that's, that's often an argument, argument which is made for alternative investments, is that they typically exhibit low correlation of um, of their returns with um, the returns on other the more traditional assets or asset classes meaning categories of investments um, traditional assets like public equity publicly traded debt etc and very importantly and this is going to be expressed in one line although it's quite a few features they are illiquid, so they exhibit illiquidity, lack of liquidity, in the sense of there being a market in which one can trade them. Well, there isn't really a market where you can uh, actively trade these types of investments. They typically require a large capital outlay, so there's a large capital, capital outlays which are involved in pretty much all categories of alternative investments. It's not necessarily possible to go in with a small amount of money. And also, long investment horizons, meaning your money or the investor's money is typically um, stays invested, stays frozen up in these investments for a considerable period, sometimes measured in years, um, as long as five, six, seven, eight, or even 10 years, or even longer in the case of infrastructure investments. Now, as a consequence of these long-term investment horizons, um, long investment horizons that we find with alternative investments, most um, investors, when they make an allocation um, to this category, 
uh, they typically match it or they typically make it for a small amount relative to their overall portfolio size so as to match these investments with um, the fact that, you know, with, with those uh, needs that will need to be met over a long time period. If you know you're going to possibly require money in the short term, you're not going to allocate that portion of your portfolio to alternative investments. But if you know you've got some outlays, some needs or some obligations coming up in a number of years, so to speak, then possibly that could be matched with an investment into an alternative, um, into the alternative category. Um, having said this, there are certain investors, for example, pension funds or non-profit organizations like endowments at universities that can adopt this long-term thinking, long-term horizon where they know they will have certain needs which will have to be met um, in, a, in a long time period, in which case they can potentially uh, dedicate or allocate more of their assets to alternative investing. Okay, well, let's now do what is going to be a, a very important section of this of this discussion. We're going to talk about the different categories of um, alternative investments. So um, let me write over here categories so as to um, make categories. OK, that's fine. Make uh, the most efficient use of the space that we've got. And we're going to start with something called private capital. Now, uh, this obviously has its own um, separate learning module, its separate chapter or learning uh, module in the in the curriculum. So there's going to be plenty of additional discussion on this later on. Um, a private capital is any funding, which is, once again, we're defining this by saying what it is not, just like before with alternative investments um, overall. So this is funding not received uh, from or, you know, uh, via public equity, so publicly traded shares, stroke um, public debt. And we could add, you know, markets. And as a result, there are sort of two strands to this. There is something called private equity, which is an extremely important part of the discussion, a, a very big market. And there's also going to be a smaller, nevertheless rising in importance market called the private debt market. Right, both belong under the heading private capital. Good. So um, we're going to start off with private equity. And this is obviously all about investors holding shares which are not listed on a public market. They're not publicly available shares. And in terms of the rights that such private equity holders enjoy, they're very similar to the rights enjoyed by public um, shareholders. And we, you know, we discuss such rights um, under the um, in the in the equity investment section of the curriculum where we list what ordinary shareholders can do um, in terms of um, exercising their rights, such as voting um, rights at the AGM, the right to receive a dividend. And these private equity holders have the same, but there are certain additional features which you may want to think about, like the holders of private equity very often enjoy a closer relationship with the management of the company. So they have... Um, more influence, more sway in in terms of influencing the decisions taken by management or receiving up to date um, current information, current disclosures about, you know, what's um, what's going on at the business, as opposed to what happens when a company uh, has a relationship with its public shareholders holding their public shares, then everything is regulated by standardized norms, uh, those shareholders receive reports on a quarterly basis and there isn't much communication that happens beyond that except for some current information on important matters. With private equity the relationship is much closer, at least typically. Okay, so um, let's define this, although you know, I've pretty much already said what this is. This is investments or investment 
in um, private, privately owned companies. And it's obviously an equity investment, meaning we, we, we buy or we invest in shares in privately owned companies or, very importantly, in public companies, so companies which are listed on a stock exchange, but with the intent, with the intention to take them private. And once again, this idea of taking companies private, um, companies that were previously public, is something I've already done a video on. You'll find it in the um, corporate issuers section of the of the curriculum, I believe. So, with the intention to take them private, delist them from the uh, from the stock exchange. Um, okay, this is often this delisting of companies, but also investments in privately owned businesses. This is often done in relation to. Um, quite mature businesses, businesses that are, you know, have stable cash flows, especially when um, the buying of a company happens via something called an LBO, leveraged buyout, when the acquirer borrows a lot of money uh, in order to make the purchase possible. And obviously, that, mon that borrowed money needs to be repaid. So the acquisition target needs to have pretty stable cash flows and sometimes quite good assets, valuable assets that can be used to pay down the debt. More on that in the corporate um, issuers section where we talk about going both public but also going private in terms of companies that were previously public and the methods uh, used to make that happen. Right, so... Um, and, and one thing that I also discuss in the, those other videos in the corporate issuers section is that, you know, the rationale behind this. Um, you sometimes take a company private because you believe that um, under private ownership, when it's away from the scrutiny of the public markets, um, the transparency, the regulations, it will be easier to implement the changes, restructuring that is necessary to make the company better, uh, improve it, restructure it, and actually raise its value. Right. Um, also, very importantly, a subcategory of private equity, this is how your curriculum views this, is something called VC. So that obviously stands for venture capital, which is all about investing in private equity again. So privately held shares, but this time of companies that are not mature, um, companies that are actually at their startup or early sort of life phase in terms of their development. And um, right, just over here, we've got private debt. Well, this is all about making private loans. So these are loans other than those made typically by banks. Um, it's also about uh, buying bonds which are not publicly uh, traded um also any type of um, right so i said um, bonds um you may come across a name called venture um as in venture capital um venture uh, debt so this is providing loans to startups or funding of a debt nature to startups or early phase sort of companies. And um, I guess one more um, here, something called distressed debt. Now, distressed debt is obviously all about buying the debt, possibly the bonds of a company that is in financial trouble. Um, actually, private equity, when I, when I said before, you know, this is about buying shares typically in mature companies, um, with the exception of venture capital. But, you know, those venture capitals, I said, should be enjoying strong cash flows. Well, sometimes those companies are actually in decline and somebody buys them, takes them private, so as to in some way turn them around. So this can involved, involve less sort of profitable companies as well. Distressed debt, however, means you're buying 
companies on the verge of bankruptcy, close to bankruptcy, or actually companies that have already defaulted on their debt, so they're not paying it, um, paying the obligations on their debt in the, in timely manner. And that could be both private debt as as well as publicly traded debt. So distressed debt is considered one of the private debt categories by your curriculum, which falls under private capital and is a section of alternative investments. Okay, so we already talked about the first category of alternative investments, namely private equity, which includes venture capital, something that will be uh, discussed later on as well in quite a lot of detail. Um, let's continue with the uh, remaining categories, equally as important, and they also have their own individual learning modules where the curriculum discusses them in more detail. Okay, so um, let me write over here a very important one, namely real estate. Now, real estate is obviously all to do with um, either making equity investments or debt investments as well, um, that is lending money. Um, in buildings, obviously, or land, um, building stroke land. And I guess, you know, everybody can appreciate that this could be commercial real estate, like, um, I don't know, shopping centers or, you know, office parks. It could be residential real estate where people live. It could be industrial real estate. Um, where factories are located or production is located. It could be you know, infrastructure-related real estate, although there will be a separate category here called infrastructure. It's, um, it's sort of discussed separately. So as I said, this could be equity investments, and sometimes these equity investments are actually made via tradable securities. Um, there's something that we're going to discuss later on as well called REITs. This stands for Real Estate Investment Trusts, and these uh, are these are sort of funds which whose securities trade or shares trade on public stock exchanges, especially in the US, in the UK. Um, when we talk about debt investing, well, that could be via things called MBSs, mortgage-backed securities, which are actually covered in the fixed income section of the curriculum. Uh, this is where you're making investments into debt securities, which are backed um, on somebody repaying their loans. So um, let me just state over here what the sources of returns are for real estate, sources of returns. It could obviously be the fact that somebody pays rent, so rents. It could be the fact um, that these things gain in value, value appreciation, if you buy and hold, I don't know, buildings or land, especially land. Um, it could then be mortgage repayments, as is the case with uh, MBSs. All of these things are absolutely sources of returns when it comes to possible sources of returns when it comes to um, making real estate investments. Okay, let's separate this and say that another category would be infrastructure, which I already mentioned. Infrastructure investments. And this is once again going to be based on land and buildings. And, uh, you know, various uh, fixed assets that occupy that land or those buildings, um, which serve some kind of uh, public purpose. So they are intended for public use. And uh, provide essential services. So examples of this could be roads for which you have to pay to drive 
on them, bridges for which you have to pay in order to drive on them. Um, you know, those are just some very classic examples of infrastructure that you may find or infrastructure investing. And um, over here, the sources of return are going to be mainly the fees associated with the fact that somebody has to pay in order to drive on that road or use that bridge. Obviously, um, these things can be leased out to others, so leases as well. Um, right. One thing that we need to mention, obviously, it's going to be talked about uh, later as well, is that when... Um, Infrastructure investments are made, typically, this kind of stuff in many countries is developed by governments. Um, however, governments may also um, invite private investors to join the investment, and then you're often going to come across something called PP. P, that's triple P. This stands for public private partnership, which is a very important way in which private investors can get involved in um, infrastructure projects, which are um, generally driven by some kind of government uh, decision. And let me say that when private investors Um, you know, they provide capital into an infrastructure project, um, you know, plus uh, they're responsible for the maintenance of that infrastructure asset subsequent to it uh, being constructed, like a bridge or a road, right, which needs to be on a regular basis maintained. Um, then what typically happens is... Um, you're going to sign what's known, so these private investors and the government or whoever is the official owner of the of the land on which the asset stands, and therefore the asset as well, uh, they sign what's known as a concession agreement. Concession agreement. And it's uh, this concession agreement that grants them, grants uh, to the private investor exclusive, exclusive, I'm um, sorry, exclusive without Lee, rights to um, operate the asset, that infrastructure asset. obviously uh, for some specified time. Um, operate the bridge, operate the road, operate some kind of other infrastructure asset. This could apply to hospitals, this could apply to prisons, as it often does in some countries. So the investor, the private investor, gives the capital, uh, is responsible for the maintenance of the asset, but can also exclusively operate the asset and charge fees for that operation and obviously earn money, which is supposed to cover that initial investment and provide a return. Okay, good. Now the next one over here is going to be, let's make sure that we delineate all the different categories. The next one I want to focus on is natural resources. And these natural resources will once again be typically um, identified with land. So we're sticking to the idea of land here quite a lot, both with real estate infrastructure, but land which is less developed. less developed than in the case of real estate or infrastructure projects. This is land which is used, um, for example, as farmland 
or it could be used as timberland, woodland. Obviously woodland from which um, trees or timber um, can be harvested. Or it could be, you know, um, land that is designated as a place from which some kind of extraction happens. Extraction, i.e. mining, drilling, that kind of exploration, right? Land once again. <laughs> Okay, some 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 part of the of some some piece of land. Now, um, what are the sources of return here? Pretty uh, pretty obvious, aren't they? Sources of return. Now, look, we're not talking yet about the actual um, produce which is extracted. We're talking about the land on which it happens because we'll talk about separately the produce. So, um, cash flows from the sale of crops, uh, timber, and so on, whatever is produced or extracted from the land. Yes, okay, that's that's obviously uh, the case. You may once again lease this out to others, so lease payments if you're leasing it out. It could be things like, you know, especially when it comes to um, exploration or extraction, uh, drilling, or uh, exploration rights, which you may grant or sell to um, some some investor, a company that wants to operate um, the extraction facility, which is not necessarily the owner right of the land. Now, um, separately from this, we can talk about commodities, right? Commodities, which uh, many investors treat as an as an interesting alternative to investing in more traditional stuff well commodities i also belong all under alternative investments um and there's subcategory of natural resources in your curriculum well these are um standardized 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 uh, traded Goods like uh, you know, like agricultural produce, wheat, soybeans, um, livestock. Um, I don't know, fertilizer, timber is also a, a, a traded commodity. Metals, energy resources like crude oil, natural gas. I mean, you, you can just go on and name these um, commodities uh, that trade on markets. And here, um, lots of people get involved. Because not necessarily because they generate, you know, cash flows from their sale. We're not going to be the producer um, of these things. You, you know, investors hope to make um, profits or returns on price fluctuations, on price changes, be it up and that or down. You can take both long or short positions with these things, especially as they're very often, um, you know, actively traded, allowing you via derivatives to take positions, um, both uh, expressing an, a positive outlook as well as a negative one. And uh, let's just say that natural resources overall, commodities included, are often considered an inflation hedge, meaning... Um, when there is inflation, uh, the prices of commodities go up as well, or actually <laughs> maybe the other way around. Inflation is, you know, the concept of prices going up uh, on average, and a big, imp big component in many countries of the inflation computation is the price of commodities that goes into most products that end consumers buy. So, you know, when there is inflation, very often commodities are also picking up in value. So that's an inflation hedge or protection against inflation. What's more, uh, these natural resources are often considered uh, counter-cyclical meaning they often go against the general trend in the economy. When the economy goes up, they go down. But when the economy goes down, they go up. Ah, you know, I don't necessarily always agree, typically agree with this, but, you know, this is something stated in your curriculum as um, one of the rationales or motives for investing in natural resources, or at least what people think. And um, once again, 
they often have low correlation with the returns on other assets. So they allow us to really diversify our portfolio, avoiding strong correlation with other things that we hold. Okay, uh, more on natural resources in a you know in a separate section of the of the uh, course. Okay, let's go over here and say hedge funds are another very important category of alternative investments, and hedge funds. Um, you know, they invest, it, when you want to define a hedge fund, it's not about stating what it invests into. It invests into, hedge funds can invest in publicly traded shares, so public equity, publicly traded bonds, um, so public debt, as well as private equity, private debt, private capital. Um, so they can invest pretty much into anything, but also real assets or infrastructure or natural resources as well. The distinguishing feature of hedge funds is kind of their investment approach rather than what they invest into is how they do it. And um, they're often associated with using a couple of elements of strategy. They often use leverage, not always, but often do, which means they either borrow money so as to be able to invest on a bigger scale than they would normally be able to afford, or they use leverage synthetically via derivatives, uh, meaning they engage a small amount of money as compared to the size on which they're playing or investing. Um, they also um, quite often uh, do what's called short selling, which means taking short positions, taking bets that something will go down in value. Although sometimes that short position is done in conjunction with a long position so as to achieve what's known as an equity market neutral strategy, for example. So it's more sophisticated than sometimes than just the betting that things will go down. But, you know, in this introductory lesson, it's the idea of short selling that interests me. And they often use derivatives, which give them synthetic exposure to certain market variables, which we call underlyings. Now, enough of this, you know, I don't want to go into more detail, seeing as we will talk about it in later lessons as well. But just be aware your curriculum talks about this here as well. Many investors get involved. Um... So it's possible to invest in these things via something called funds of funds. So this is um, investing in a fund which invests in actual hedge funds. It's a diversified fund holding positions in investment funds. More on that in a separate, uh, separate videos. Now, let me just mention two more things which your curriculum talks about here. Digital assets. I'm just going to say here, define this very briefly, separate lesson on this as well, separate learning module on this. Uh, these are assets which are created, sorry, created, transferred, and also stored electronically. Um, so their whole, you know, life cycle is electronic, and this could be things like cryptocurrencies, tokens, digital art. Um, where obviously the ownership rights to these things or the right of use is conveyed via some kind of electronic mean. Um, more on that later on. And something that we don't necessarily explore separately, collectibles as well. So, you know, things like fine art, antiques, quality wine, um, stamps, rare coins, anything that people collect, that's also treated, possibly uh, is treated as a, as, a, as a subcategory of alternative investment. In the final section of this uh, video, we're going to discuss the methods that investors use to put capital into alternative investments, irrespective of what those investments are now uh, which category it actually is your curriculum actually identifies 
three methods that it discusses in quite a lot of detail. And those methods are, let me start over here, maybe with uh, fund investment. Then something called co-investment. And finally, direct investment. And um, we're obviously going to start off over here with fund investment, but b before we um, discuss the details, the whole idea is that when you invest via a specialized alternative investment fund, you're sort of investing indirectly. You give money to a fund manager, the fund manager makes the investment choices. And um, your curriculum is very strong on stating that this is the, the route, the path often chosen by the less experienced investors or those who have smaller resources and it cannot, they cannot afford to make sort of a more direct investment on their own. So typically chosen by those who have less skills, less knowledge, less experience, but also maybe less wealth um, or limited resources. However, especially in the case of institutional investors, big ones, who have a lot of resources, they often use fund investments as a bit of an intermediary stage, which allows them to gain some experience. And once that, that experience and knowledge is built up, they often move towards co-investment, which is investing alongside a fund, and then direct investment, which is all about investing completely on your own. Something that I'll, um, that I'll stress, right, uh, as well. So fund investment, the first one, let me emphasize this because your curriculum is so strong on this. I think it's very good. It's a very good candidate for um, a theoretical question. Typically chosen, this this route is typically chosen by um, investors with maybe limited resources. That's one thing, but not necessarily. Um, limited experience, or both, or one of these, you know, limited experience. Good. Um, so obviously the setup here is going to be quite simple. You've got the investors, multiple investors, and in the next video you'll we'll talk about typical fund structures, how these investors often um, are limited partners in a limited partnership. Uh, we'll be discussing that. These investors provide capital to a fund and um, the investors themselves have either very little or in fact no influence um, over what the fund does, um, over or on funds investment decisions. That's not their job. Um, in fact, <laughs> In the next lesson, you see that if the investors are something called limited partners, they shouldn't even have, you know, by law, any any involvement in how the fund gets run and what investments it makes. Because obviously, it's the fund over here and the fund manager that identifies, so selects and, um, you know, identifies and makes investments, obviously, on behalf of the investors but also uh, monitors those investments and monitors the uh, performance of those investments. And it's doing this on, the, on behalf of the investors. So investors don't just provide capital, um, they also pay to the fund or the fund manager a management fee, something we'll talk about as well. And there is a in the second learning module of um, of this topic area, there's a big discussion on how uh, these fees get computed. Actually, maybe not the management fee as such, but something else called the performance fee. How it gets structured, how, it's get, how it gets computed, uh, what type of features are built into it. 
to align the interests of the manager and investors as well. So, um, you know, the whole idea is that the investors don't have really influence. They shouldn't. They don't really have the experience typically or the skills to do so. They leave that to the manager who's supposed to have the skills and, um, and the knowledge and the experience necessary to run all of this. Now, there are some features. Features of alternative investment funds that I want to talk about here, which make them stand out from other types of funds you may know, like equity funds, bond funds, etc. Um, so this is as compared to classic funds that are publicly available to many investors. What you'll often find, and this is something we'll discuss further on as well, is the notion that money or funds, meaning money, are pre-committed. Investors first commit money to the fund, which doesn't mean they pay into the fund, but when the fund is formed, it first of all seeks enough investors with capital to actually get the fund going, get the fund off, off the ground. So first, it receives commitments from investors, and only then is it able to actually officially launch and make investments. Funds are pre-committed before investments, any investments are actually made. And when those, um, you know, ident when those investments are identified, um, these ones, right, um, the fund manager will typically call on the um, on the investors who previously made commitments and say, okay, this is the t now the time for you to pay me money uh, because I've, I've got something that I want to invest into. You'll see later on that this is called a drawdown, this, this action of calling on investors. Now, um, another thing which goes in hand with something we've already written before is the long typically the long investment period due to the long investment horizon associated with this type of investing. Um, another point is definitely higher, but also more complex in terms of their structure. Fees charged by managers, especially this performance fee, can be a very complex computation. Um, however, please appreciate that the performance fee is an extremely important mechanism which serves to align the interests of investors and fund managers. Fund, fund managers have more skills, more knowledge, more experience, and they've got better access to information. And so as to make sure that they act in the best interest of investors, they get paid a performance fee which is based on, obviously, how much profit the investors end up making. And one more point here, perhaps, is the fact that these types of funds, as compared, so let me stress here, as compared to the more sort of traditional funds that are widely available to most investors, these definitely are not. You often have to be what's known as an accredited investor to participate in alternative investment funds. Um, so these types of funds have less frequent, uh, frequent reporting to, um, to investors um, in terms of what the fund holds, the value of those positions, the returns, etc. They're less liquid anyway, so it's not so easy to actually perform precise valuations of the fund's positions on such a frequent basis. And one more thing that your curriculum states, so let me put this down, something called the term sheet. The term sheet is a document which outlines the terms of the investment into such a fund. Okay, something that may be mentioned in a question somewhere. So just so that you know. Okay, now the next type of 
investment method or investment approach is something called a co-investment. And um, this is obviously sometimes chosen by those investors who already here have experience from fund investment. So let me say that as your experience grows in the world of alternative investments, you may move towards co-investment. This is um, you know, a very specific type of strategy. This is where the investor still gives money to a fund and the fund makes some investments, be it in private equity or in uh, some other sort of space. But the investor also, so this is indirect investing because you're doing it via a fund, indirect. But at the same time, so alongside this simultaneously, the investor is also allowed to co-invest and provide I know, money here as well, right? So this is a dollar sign, which is supposed to symbolize capital. So this is a direct investment kind of alongside the fund doing the same thing. Um, right. Why is this beneficial? Well, why is this beneficial for both parties? Let's start with the benefits for the investor. The plus here is supposed to denote advantages. The plus for the investor is such that it obviously allows the investor to learn more because now they're also allowed to invest directly. This expands their knowledge, expands investors' knowledge, and experience, all good stuff, especially if the idea is later on to be able to make in completely independent investments, which are called direct investment uh, investing. Okay, uh, what is more, um, they're um, able to access the investment, so the investor has access to the investment opportunity, at lower cost because you no longer need to put your all of your money via a fund which charges you management fees performance fees etc um but obviously also um this idea of knowledge experience let me say learns the investor learns um the funds process how the fund approaches investing, and that obviously gets them ready for direct investing. So actually the first and the second point, the first and the third point as raised by your books is, is very compatible. Um, but this is not a strategy where you can just sit passively and do nothing. You're going to have to also expend some resources on oversight. So, but higher uh, sort of, oversight or monitoring costs. Uh, if you just you know invest via a fund, so indirectly, the fund manager does all the oversight and the monitoring here, that's something which you have to do as well. Now, what about the benefits, the pluses for the fund itself? Why would it allow a co-investor, one of the investors, to put money directly as well? Well, for the fund or the fund manager, it expands the um, investment scope. It means there is more money in the portfolio that's available to be used which increases the width of what we can do, the spectrum of what we can do. It may also accelerate timing of investments. Um, if you can encourage an investor to give to to also participate in the investment directly, maybe they're hesitant to give you all the money that, you know via the fund. But if you encourage them to do this, this allows us to make quicker entries. 
and perhaps in the world of private equity sees opportunities which would otherwise disappear. And obviously, expanding the scope of investments leads to higher diversification, potentially, obviously, if the money is used to diversify the portfolio, which is not always the case, but potentially, right? Now, um, the final one, direct investment. This is really something um, quite rare in the sense of it's only typically done by big players, big institutional investors. Very often found are uh, typically uh, done in the world of private equity, which is buying shares, you know, equity stakes in a, in a privately held business, but also real estate. Okay, and this this is you know buying entire commercial buildings or industrial buildings. Um, doing this uh, is typically the domain of um, of uh, wealthy investors. Although the really big ones can also go alone and directly invest in things like infrastructure, for example, that's also uh, possible or natural resources. Nevertheless, once again, let me stress that moving to direct investment is often done only once you've got the experience from the other stages. So it's typically begin with fund investing, then when your knowledge expands, you're able to, you know, once you've learned a little bit about how the process of the fund works, you move into here. Obviously, there is nothing forcing you to move here. But when people move, it's typically as a result of previously being somewhere here as well. Now, um, so let me stress that this is typically available, typically available to the biggest and most sophisticated investors. So don't be surprised that your curriculum has this gradation, so to speak. Investors who are smaller, have less sophistication, less knowledge and experience should stay according to your curriculum in this area and move only here once they've grown bigger and once their experience has increased as well. Now, what are the advantages of doing this for the investor? Well, they get full control over the whole investment process. They, um, you know, over investment process, investment choice, things like timing when the investment is made, the financing, the funding used, what mix of equity and debt capital should be uh, used, right? Um, and, you know, there's, there's flexibility for them as well in this, in, with regard to all these, um, all these, um, all these dimensions. However, the downside is it requires skill, knowledge, and typically uh, lots of experience. Plus, let's not forget, this is a big one, oversight costs. When you start to invest directly, you really need to have the resources necessary to oversee and monitor how that investment is going.